In the past, I hadn't spent a lot of time working with shocks. Usually I just buy them, complain about the price, put them on my car, and move on with my life. My Honda S600 has motorcycle shocks, which are not even remotely well suited for this application, but they were cheap, so that was nice. But it has come time to dig into the nuts and bolts, the shims and pistons of an automotive shock, because my Honda is overdamped, my Jag is too stiff, my Forerunner shocks desperately need a rebuild, and the off-road Viper needs coilovers. So join me as I learn about stroke length, hardened shafts, and orifices with the maturity of an 8-year-old. This is a shock, actually a shock absorber, but we'll just call it a shock. An Icon 2.5 off-road shock for the rear of a Toyota 4Runner. It has seen better days. It was working fine until I hit a rock really hard in Moab and it leaked out all its fluid. It needs a rebuild, and since I don't know anything about rebuilding shocks, I decided that I would be the best person to do it. Step 1. Take it apart, I think. That seems like step 1. I started with the reservoir for no particular reason. I let out the nitrogen pressure and removed the retaining ring, but the end cap was kind of stuck in there. So I gently pressed the shaft into the body, which pressurizes the reservoir, and popped the cap off. So far, so good. But just in case, maybe I should learn a little more about shocks before proceeding. The shocks that are going into the Viper are Fox Performance Series. I'll get into why I chose Fox in a minute, but I bought these from a company called AccuTune. The reason I chose them is that they will set up the shocks and springs for you. You fill out a form with all the pertinent info, and they will select the springs and change out the shims for your application. They'll also swap in better pistons, add 90 degree fittings to your required direction, and you can send the shocks back to them to retune the springs and shims if you end up adding a front steel bumper to your Viper that weighs more than you expected, which is a thing that happens sometimes. Anyway, while they were revalving my shocks, they were kind enough to invite me out to check out the process and ask some questions. Questions like, what does all this stuff do? At its simplest, a shock exists to damp oscillations, to prevent the spring from just continually going up and down. Notice I said damp and not dampen. To damp is to reduce the amplitude of vibrations. To dampen is to make something slightly wet. This is a damper. This is a dampener. This is a damper and a dampener. Anyway, almost all automotive shocks damp oscillations by controlling the flow of fluid. This is a pretty common layout for an aftermarket shock. You have the shaft, the body, and a separate reservoir. Inside the shock, attached to the end of the shaft, is the piston and shim stack. This is where the fluid flow is controlled. We'll get into the specifics of that in a minute. So the shock body has caps on both ends to seal it off. It has a shaft that moves in and out with a piston on one end that controls the fluid flow. This would be all you need, except that when the shaft is pushed into the shock body, it displaces some of the fluid. This part of the shaft that was outside the shock body is now inside. Since it's a fixed volume and since the fluid can't be compressed, that much volume of fluid needs to go outside the body. This is where the reservoir comes in. It's half filled with compressed air, nitrogen usually. When the shock is compressed, some of that fluid goes into the reservoir, making this internal floating piston move and compressing the nitrogen. The nitrogen has pressure when the shock is fully open, around 200 PSI on off-road applications. This keeps the fluid pressurized and will help prevent the fluid from cavitating. Cavitation is just small vapor bubbles that form behind the piston when it moves really fast and creates a low pressure zone. Sometimes there's no internal floating piston, there's just a bladder of air. Sometimes the piston is inside the main shock body. Sometimes the reservoir is sort of wrapped around the shock body, so you have a tube within a tube. This is a twin tube design, and it's pretty common on cars. They all kind of work the same, squishing air somewhere so that the shaft can move in and out and the fluid can displace somewhere. There are also emulsion shocks, which just mix the nitrogen and fluid together all willy-nilly. It's basically like pouring a Guinness into your shocks. They're cheaper, but they're inconsistent and much harder to tune. You end up with random damping characteristics and really high gas pressure, so your springs are too small and your car flops around like a wet noodle. Anyway, these are some common shock types, and these are the basic components. All of these caps have seals to keep the fluid and nitrogen in their respective areas. There are also bushings to keep everything moving smoothly. These are the parts I'm going to be replacing while rebuilding these icons. Most of these shocks also contain a spacer. This spacer keeps some distance between the end of your shock body and the piston inside. This space help gives the shock some stability. They're also used to limit the extension length of the shock. In the front icons on my 4Runner, they're presumably there to limit the droop to what Toyota suspension can handle. On some shocks, there are two, and you can remove one of them to get a longer extended length. Interesting thing here, this is just a piece of aluminum rod with a hole drilled in it. The icon shocks I have, they didn't even machine the outside of it. This is just how it comes out of the aluminum extrusion. It still has the printing telling you about the mill and the alloy. I also saw a few King shocks disassembled, and they had the same printed raw finish. I didn't buy the Icons new, nor the King, so I can't be certain these came from the factory like this, but the Fox shocks have a machined outer surface and a nice smooth finish, which definitely makes it feel like a nicer product. 
The Fox also have this nice rubber bumper to soften the blow when the shocks are fully extended. I didn't see this on any of the King shocks nor the Icons, though the Icons do have a couple of beveled washers that will act like a bit of a spring to lessen the impact at full rebound. The shaft of the Fox shocks is also much harder than the King's, which will help prevent rock chips and dings that will kill your seals. I like a hard shaft. That's right, I said it. I've heard some people say that you don't want these heat treated too hard because they'll be brittle, but in materials, brittle doesn't mean weak. And if you've exceeded the strength of a 7 8 of an inch shaft of your shocks to the point where they break, you have bigger problems. In any case, King and Icon have had a lot of success off-road. They're pretty great at what they do. They're all top tier. There are a bunch of other brands, and you can spend less money on off-road shocks, a lot less, but this is one of those areas where you do get what you pay for. <laughs> This part here is where all the magic happens. This is the piston in the middle, the shims on the outside, and a nut holding it all together. There's a lot going on here, but let's start with these small holes drilled through the outside of the piston. These are just holes. If you move the piston up or down slowly, all the fluid goes through these holes. These control your low speed damping. The size of these holes is part of the tune. I had new pistons installed in my shocks and AccuTune drilled out the holes to their specifications based on the info I sent them. On some shocks, this will just be one hole through the middle of the shaft, and sometimes you'll have a needle going through that you can adjust in or out, effectively making the hole larger or smaller. You can actually make a shock with just one hole, no shims or springs or anything. This is how it was done back in the day, and some cheaper motorcycles still do this. The problem is that your damping is super progressive. In other words, you don't get much damping at low speeds, and you get way too much at high speeds. The rest of the piston is basically just a couple of one-way doors. Fluid goes around the shim stack on the bottom and is funneled to the middle of the piston on the top. When the piston is moving the other direction, the fluid goes around the outside of the top and comes out on the middle of the bottom. It's basically two funnels stacked together. There are a couple of ways this is done. This is a common design. It's very much just two funnels alternating around in a circle. This is the kind that my Fox shocks came with and one of the things we changed. We swapped it out for a nicer CNC machined Fox factory race piston, which accomplishes the same thing, but with better flow. It's actually less flow, which makes the ride less soft and squishy, but results in better performance. I'm told the bang for the buck is great with the race piston, especially if you're already taking apart the shock to change the shims anyway. You can see there are six holes in one direction, but only three in the other direction. This is set up so you can have a lot more flow and compression than rebound. My Icon shocks use a two-piece piston. It accomplishes the same thing with six outlets on one side and three on the other. But instead of fancy machining, it's just two simple parts with milled pockets and drilled holes. Before we talk about the shim stack, we have to talk about graphs. That's right, damper curves. This axis here is how fast your damper is moving. When we say high speed or low speed, we're not talking about the car, but the speed of the piston and shaft moving in and out of the shock. This is when you sit down on your tailgate, and this is when you hit a speed bump at 60. This axis is how much the damper is pushing back against that movement. The higher up we go, the harder it is to compress the shock. This graph is just the compression side of the shock. When it's extending, you have a different curve that looks kind of like this. It's upside down because the force is in the opposite direction, but we're not going to talk about this part today. The shim stack is just a spring. That's all it is. If you push on it with fluid, it moves back. If you push harder, it moves farther. The shims are usually stacked largest to smallest. This just helps prevent the shims from all deforming after a bunch of cycles. Think of it as a leaf spring rotated around a circle. Note that you can't replace two shims that are 10 thousandths of an inch thick with one that's 20 thousandths. The stiffness is proportional to the thickness cubed, so a 20 thousandths shim will be eight times as stiff as a 10 thousandths shim. Changing the different shims will do different things to the curve. For instance, this last shim here is called the pivot. The thickness of it doesn't really affect anything since it has a washer or a nut behind it, but if you change the diameter, it will shorten the lever arm of all of the other shims, making the whole curve stiffer by increasing the rate. The shim on the opposite side of the stack will sort of shift the whole curve up or down. Note that none of this affects what's going on way down here because this is all dictated by those small holes drilled in the piston. But shims aren't always stacked like this, at least not on the compression side. Sometimes you'll have a small diameter shim thrown in the middle. This gives you a dual stage shim stack. Why would you want this? Well, remember how we could make a shock by just having a small orifice, but the damping was way too progressive? With a regular shim stack, you get a linear curve, but you might want a little progressive. You might want a little more damping at very high speed, and you can get that by splitting your stack with a small shim in the middle. This is called the crossover shim. This gives you two separate parts of your damping curve. The lower shim stack controls this part, the upper controls this part. Those holes we drilled still control the low speed stuff. You can add shims to the bottom and change the slope of the bottom without changing the slope of the top and vice versa. You can tune the location of this knee by changing the stiffness of the crossover shim. A thicker shim will move this point farther up the graph. 
You can bend this graph the other way by preloading the first shim. Icon and Bilstein do this on a lot of their off-road shocks. This will give you a more firm ride at low speeds. Washboard roads will be more harsh, but it won't flop around like an old Cadillac in low-speed corners. Digressive curves will give better handling by themselves, but the approach I prefer is to have a more linear curve so that the shocks do the ride quality and the handling is taken care of with the anti-roll bars. These shocks have another shim stack as well. Remember how we talked about the shaft moving in and out of the shock body displaces the fluid and pushes it into the reservoir? Well, the passage between the shock body and the reservoir also has a shim stack. This is where the compression adjusters are. My shock has high speed and low speed. The low speed adjuster is just a needle that blocks off a hole, allowing more or less fluid through. At high speed, the fluid is moving too fast to all go through the small hole, so it pushes the shim stack away and flows through that passage. That shim stack has a coil spring that pushes down on it. The high speed adjuster just preloads that spring more or less, causing more or less resistance to the fluid flow. The rebound side is just a one way valve. Moving these adjusters in or out just kind of shifts your whole damping curve up or down. It's a little more complicated than this since the transition between high and low speed moves each time you change the setting, and it also probably doesn't line up exactly with the main shim stack curve, but you get the idea. Remember how earlier I said that some cheap motorcycles still use a simple hole for damping? Well, the Grom is notorious for having a crappy rear shock from the factory. Lots of people recommend dropping 500 bucks on the Olins, which seems like a lot for a $3,500 bike. But I decided to disassemble my Grom rear shock to see what was going on inside. See how complicated it is. Unfortunately, my spring compressors were too big to get the spring off, so I get to introduce a new segment I like to call Don't Try This At Home. Probably should have put the guard back on the cutoff tool for this one. The rest of the shock was not serviceable. It doesn't have that nice screw on cap like the off-road shocks. So I continued with the brute force. To my surprise, the rear Grom coilover is actually pretty complex. It's a twin tube design having the reservoir kind of wrapped around the damper. It has shims just like the other shocks, though they're not in a pyramid, probably because they're so small already. There were some smaller shims thrown in there and also some shims and a one-way valve on the passage between the inner and outer tube. So there's definitely a lot of design and effort put into this shock. Not bad for a hundred bucks. Then I thought, why not take apart the shocks on my Jag? They also don't look serviceable, and before I hit them with a the Sawzall, I remembered they were almost 500 bucks each, and I found a cutaway image online. Looks like a monotube shock, a standard shock with the internal floating piston inside the main body. No, Matt. Aww. So, how are off-road shocks different from other shocks? Well, they're not, really. They're pretty much the same, just bigger. The shock in my mountain bike is fundamentally the same. In fact, the piston inside looks pretty much the same, just smaller. Even the off-road shocks that look different are fundamentally the same. Pistons, shims, nitrogen. They just have extra bypass passages that change the damping at different parts of their stroke. So at fully extended, the shock is progressive, but when it's mostly closed, it becomes digressive. You'll sometimes hear that off-road shocks are more or less progressive, but there are as many approaches to this off-road as there are on-road. What you want depends on what kind of driving you're doing. Rock crawling, desert running, doing sweet jumps all require a different tune. One area where off-road shocks differ is thermal management. There's a lot going on off-road, so the shocks are moving a lot, generating a lot of heat. This is part of the reason why they're so much bigger, not just longer in length, but larger diameter. On the racing trucks, you'll see cooling fins, or sometimes a bypass shock will run fluid through a radiator on one of the bypass circuits. But if your fluid is getting too hot, sometimes you can just get a bigger diameter shock, or supplement your shock with another shock. Put shocks on your shocks. Shots! Everybody's shocks are doing basically the same thing, and they're doing it in basically the same way. On-road, off-road, motorcycles, mountain bikes, it's all the same, mostly. So, there you go. You thought you were going to learn about off-road shocks, but instead you learned about all shocks. And now I can actually finish rebuilding these things. The standard rebuild kit is mostly seals, entirely seals actually, mostly O-rings. There are some other wear items that don't come with the rebuild kit, like this bushing in here and the one that goes around the piston. I'm not going to worry about the one down here, mostly because I'm not sure how to get it out, but also because it looks fine. The one around the piston, it's called a wear band, looks a little worn and they're 10 bucks each, so I'll replace those. The shafts are a bit dinged up around the rear shock, so I'm going to replace those as well. That is, if I can find the ones I need, Icon's website is not great. The fronts are fine, but the rears are very pitted. So pitted. I think it's because rocks keep flying up and hitting them. Whoopa. And after a while, they can't take the dings anymore. Snap. Ah. And that's how they get pitted. Not surprising since these shocks are almost as old as my ancient pop culture references. I made an aluminum condom to help get the seals back on the shaft. I will also need to press in new spherical bearings since the ones on the shocks are wrecked. But I'll finish all this up later, because as you know, I am easily distracted from one project by another project. And this project is way more interesting right now.
While the world outside of an off-road coilover shock is chaotic and random, what's going on inside is pretty well known. All of these components follow predictable rules. The springs follow Hooke's law. The pressure applied by the nitrogen to the piston results in a force at the shaft. Learning what everything does in a shock is fun, but learning why and how all of these things react the way they do is what allows you to make it better and allows you to make it right for your application. It's physics and math, and if you learn like I do with diagrams, pictures, and puzzles, then I recommend you try Brilliant. This is the best way I've found to really grasp a concept quickly and effectively, and intuitively. I'm not going to remember what happens when a spring oscillates in a system unless I can visualize it and wrap my head around a real-world concept. Brilliant has the right amount of challenges with lots of subjects ranging from basic to advanced. It's great for students, professionals, lifelong learners. I've been going through the classical mechanics course. What happens to that nitrogen when you compress the shock? How does it change the force at the shaft? Well, if you know the ideal gas law and you can calculate the area of two circles, you know the answer. If you want to know more about what's happening in the world around you, then try Brilliant free for 30 days. Visit brilliant.org slash superfastmat or click the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. It used to be that you had to impress people to get people to watch your show. Now you just have to impress the algorithm. So do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. All hail the algorithm. <laughs>